Hello and welcome back to Intercepting Communication. So in this video, we're going to be talking all about the Transmission Control Protocol, aka TCP. So remember back in the Internet Protocol Packet Structure uh, series that we have this concept of a protocol byte within an IP packet, right? We've got this question mark, question mark, what protocol are we about to be sending? Well, as you might guess based off of the pattern between IP and Ethernet, this protocol is going to be set to TCP, right? So in this case, we've set it to 06. 06 indicates that we are going to be sending a transmission control protocol packet. And suddenly now we can fill in our header checksum as well, and we can fill in a bunch of data, okay? We're filling in the transmission control protocol packet and we've got a structure to it as well, just like as the other videos. And again, um, as we mentioned in the internet protocol video, we've got this length field that kind of declares the total length between the internet protocol um, packet, right? We've got this initially this one four uh, over in the uh, fourth byte, and then we've got that being updated to a 2.8 to kind of account for the fact that now we've got this extra data. We've got this transmission control protocol packet. So now we've got 2.8, right? Hex 2.8. So we've got this transmission control protocol packet. And the thing to know about transmission control protocol is that it serves a, another functionality. So Ethernet, we said, was being used for two directly linked hosts to directly linked devices to be able to send data to one another. And then we had this concept of the internet protocol sitting on top of it, which enabled this routing capability. We have this capability of um, this potentially complex network and routing it all the way through a bunch of hosts that through a, a bunch of routers that are slowly getting that packet of information where it's going. And then finally, now we have this transmission control protocol. And what that enables is a stateful conversation between two hosts. So uh, IP, internet protocol, enables routing. Ethernet enables just directly linked data to be spoken to each other. Now transmission control protocol enables a stateful interaction where if we have two hosts that might need to send data back and forth, this data might be arriving out of order. And this transmission control protocol is going to enable some concept of order and some concept of making sure all the data that was intended to be sent was in fact sent um, in the correct order. Init additionally, it allows this concept of ports. So our host might be uh, trying to speak all sorts of concurrent networked conversations over the network. Um, and they might be going to different programs. And so Transmission Control Protocol also handles this concept of ports. So within the packet structure of Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, we have the first two bytes being dedicated to being the source port. So when I'm sending this packet of information out over TCP, I'm going through some source port which is going to allow the receiver to kind of reply back on that source port, etc. Um, we've got the source port of data flowing out, and in this case, we've got it set to uh, decimal 31337, uh, elite or whatever, you know. Um, and we've got the source port, so this data is going to be flowing out of this kind of conceptual source port. Furthermore, we've got a destination port, so the, the server is going to be or the destination is going to have some destination port. We're going to be sending data to that destination port. Um, so we're able to kind of have this concept of multiple applications on a host using different ports and that data being kind of directly uh, put where it is meant to be going. Okay, so as we said before, the TCP protocol um, allows for this concept of a stateful conversation, basically making sure that all of the data is sent in the correct order, it arrives in the correct order, that if I need some data to be sent before this other data, right, it's all getting ordered correctly. Well, in order to do that ordering, we use this sequence number. And the sequence number, when we have follow on data within TCP, right, we've got this concept in networking of stacking protocols on top of each other, that data that we're going to be sending and delivering within these TCP packets, we are using a sequence number to kind of declare um, 
where in the conversation we are, what part of the conversation we're at. Um, we're gonna have some random initialized value. In this case, we're just kind of using 000, but in standard implementations, it's going to be a random value. Um, and that number is just gonna slowly grow as we go through our conversation, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, furthermore, we've got an acknowledgement number. So we've got two hosts talking to each other. Um, one is kind of, you know, we've got our sequence number. This is where I'm at on my side of the connection. This is how much data in some sense I've sent. This is how much we've progressed in the statefulness of this interaction with the sequence number. I'm also going to be acknowledging to um, the partner within this conversation that I understand that they've sent this much so far. So by between the sequence number and this acknowledgement number, um, both ends can kind of keep track of how much they've sent and how much they realize that the other host has sent to them so that we can kind of have our side of the state and kind of agree that they've sent this much so far. And we can kind of agree and converge on these values um, so that both sides know how much they've sent um, and how much the other person has sent. So we use the sequence number and acknowledgement number for doing that. Um, and this will make a little bit more sense in an example at the end of this video. Okay, we've also got this data offset. So as we said before, right, we're stacking all of these protocols on top of each other. In this case, the this TCP portion of the packet is taking up 20 bytes. And again, that is um, a variable length because just as in IP, we can have a bunch of optional data within this header. So in this case, we've got five times four, 20 bytes. We've got 20 bytes of header data. And after that is when the data starts. So that's kind of like the offset to the data within our TCP packet. Okay, next three bits are reserved. So um, I guess the creators of this protocol decided that they didn't really need these three bits yet, but who knows, in the future, the protocol might be updated. These three bits might be uh, used. In fact, there's, there's a good chance there's already experimental or maybe even stable things that have already found use cases for those three bits to do all sorts of interesting things, but we're not gonna investigate that right now. Okay, the next nine bits are super critical as well. So we have this source port, this destination port, which we're super critical to kind of figuring out our application. We've got sequence number and acknowledgement number, which are super critical for figuring out um, where in the interaction we are. Now we've also got these flags, which are used to perform different types of operations within this TCP um, stateful interaction. And we're going to look at those flags on the in a fall or in the um, next slides. Um, but this these flag bits kind of declare operations within the TCP interaction um, relating to these sequence number, acknowledgement numbers, the ability to say, hey, I'm starting up an interaction. Hey, I acknowledge what you're saying. Hey, I'm done with this interaction, etc. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay, these next two bytes are the window size. So this declares to the destination hey, when you send me data, um, don't send me data bigger than this, basically. This is my window size. So I only am willing for you to include this much data, maybe due to network congestion reasons or uh, physical hardware limitations or whatever. Um, don't send me too much data at once. And this is fine, right? We can break apart within TCP. Um, similar in IP, right? We, we kind of briefly discuss this idea of fragmenting. Well, TCP has its own kind of similar concept of fragmenting, though it's a little more sophisticated. Um, and that is the to do with the window size, right? We have bits of data that can be sent. And the reason that this is totally fine is because we have these sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. So I could just send one byte at a time and just keep incrementing the sequence number one byte at a time, as we'll see um, in future slides. Um, and this window size declares how much data I'm willing to receive at once. Um, if you send me too much, I might not acknowledge that you sent it to me. So please just send me this much data at most. Okay, uh, similar to IP, we've got a checksum. This is just basically saying, okay, all of this data within um, the header, as well as actually it kind of looks at the IP layer as well for that source and destination IP address. It kind of takes a checksum of all of this to make sure that no data was corrupted um, during transmission, just kind of a little safety check. Okay, and then we also have two bytes of urgent pointer. So one of those flags allows us to declare that, hey, data right now is super urgent. Um, 
and it uses this urgent pointer to indicate what part of the data is super urgent. It's not very popularly used, but I figured we would mention it. We've got this urgent pointer, in this case, just 0000, um, that is part of TCP, though it is not commonly used. And then we also, of course, as with an IP, have a bunch of capabilities for optional data. So for example, we can put um, timestamps on transmission information. Um, as well as other things, and it's a bunch of just optional data. In this case, we're not really going to look at it, but there is the capability for optional data, and we can use that previous data offset field to kind of determine how much optional data there is. Okay, so let's look at those flags. So there are a total of nine flags. In this case, we're just going to be taking a look at some of them. Um, so the first one that we're going to point out is that urgent flag. Now, again, I said that this isn't commonly used. This flag isn't super important, but since there is an urgent pointer within that data structure, I figured I'd point it out. It indicates that the urgent pointer field is significant. Again, you're probably not going to see this a whole lot. It's not very popularly used, but it is a capability of TCP. The next field is the acknowledgement flag. So this one is very commonly used. In fact, you're going to see this flag used in um, basically every packet except the initial one, as this says. So this indicates that the acknowledgement field is significant. So this means, okay, I'm acknowledging what you're saying, and all the packets after that initial, we're going to see one of the future flags, the SIN packet is sent by the client should have this flag set. So this means um, every time I'm responding or sending out data, I'm acknowledging how far the other party of this interaction, how far along they are, what their sequence number is. I'm acknowledging it. Um, and this is what you're going to see this in just about every packet. Okay, the next flag is not super critical, though it is actually used, and certainly compared to the urgent flag is used, it is the push function. So it asks to push the buffered data to the receiving application. And the reason for this is that we have this concept of buffered data, right? Because all of this data can arrive out of order. We might need to buffer it and slowly build up and kind of piece together all the bits of data as all these packets come in, you know, potentially coming across hundreds of hosts, it might come out of order in this weird way, we're going to need to buffer that data into its original um, form. Um, and the push function basically says, okay, don't wait for more data. Assuming you've got up to like a contiguous bit of data, like we've got where we're at and all the previous data has already arrived, I want you to push that up to the, the person that's reading this data, up to the application that's actually reading this data. Um, don't keep buffering, just send it straight to them. This is super important for them to start looking at. Um, and we'll see that the push function or the push flag is in fact used um, in a little bit. Okay, the reset flag um, basically says, okay, something has gone wrong. Um, not necessarily something has gone wrong, but potentially something has gone wrong. Um, and I need to reset the connection. So you're going to see this, for example, if you start connecting to ports that don't have applications listening on them, you're going to see reset flags coming. It's basically saying, um, what are you doing? I don't know. Just try again, maybe. Uh, that's, that's what the reset flag is saying. If something has gone wrong, uh, we need to just try again, basically. Um, okay, and then the SYN flag is very uh, important. It synchronizes sequence numbers. So only the first packet sent from each end should have this flag set. So as I previously said, um, those sequence numbers and those acknowledgement numbers, right, kind of the, the, the pair of numbers, um, are initialized to random values. So each side starts with a random value in common, in common implementations. And in order to get this starting number set so that both sides agree on where each side is starting from, what the initial number is going to be, each side is going to initially set this flag when they have their synchronize or their sequence number set um, to kind of declare, okay, we're synchronizing sequence numbers now. This is where I'm going to be starting from, and we're going to slowly be incrementing from here. Uh, and again, we'll see that in the example in a little bit. Okay, and then finally, we have the fin packet, uh, the fin flag, which indicates, okay, this is the last packet. I'm not going to be sending you more data after this. This is kind of the end of the interaction. You can uh, assume we're done now. Okay, so let's imagine now some TCP transmission. Transmission control protocol, we want to transmit something. So we have from host A to host B, we want to send the message, hello world. So what is that going to look like? 
Well, the first thing that's going to happen is what's known as the TCP handshake. So I said that we need to synchronize our sequence numbers, that we're both going to have these random values and we're going to use these to track where we are in our interaction. The reason we need to track where we are in the interaction is these packets are going to be split apart potentially, and they're going to be arriving out of order, and who knows what crazy things are going on in that network, right? We might be sending something from one side of the Earth to the other side of the Earth, and all these packets might be taking different routes. They're probably going to be taking the same routes, but who knows? Crazy things can happen in the network. Suddenly a node might go down, and the packet might have to get rerouted a different way. Um, all these packets have the capability of arriving out of order or not showing up altogether, et cetera. And we need these sequence numbers to be initialized so that we can keep track of our stateful interaction. So this TCP handshake is how we're going to initialize these sequence numbers and get into an agreement between the two hosts of where each side is starting from. So the very first thing that's gonna happen is that when host A wants to talk to host B in order to send that hello world message, host A is going to send a TCP packet to host B with the, only the SYN flag set. And it's going to have some sequence number, which in this case we're gonna call A. You could imagine starting at zero, but popular implementations start at a random number. Um, and we're, we're just gonna declare that random number A. Okay, so host B is going to respond, and it's also going to set the sin flag, and it's also going to set the acknowledgement flag. So we started with a sin, and then we have a sin ack. Um, this is a very common terminology within the TCP world, the TCP handshake. We have the sin, then the sin ack. So the sin ack is also host B needs to initialize its sequence number, and it needs to acknowledge host A and say, okay, I acknowledge what your sequence number is, and it's going to add one as well. It's going to acknowledge it, it's going to add one because we're kind of, uh, you can imagine we're progressing through the interaction, that's kind of why it's adding one. Um, and we're acknowledging, okay, so you said your sequence number is here, so I'm expecting uh, that your next sequence number is going to be A plus one, basically. Um, and I'm also going to initialize my sequence number. So we have the sin part and we have the act part. Okay, host A now needs to respond as well it needs to do an act, right? It's not doing a sin again. It's already initialized its sequence number. We don't need to send a sin anymore because we can tell already that host B has acknowledged our sequence number. So it's in agreement with us. We know we're in agreement with each other. We don't need to synchronize our sequence number anymore. Um, and we're going to now set our sequence number to A plus one. And just as host B acknowledged our sequence number, uh, we need to acknowledge host B's sequence number. So we're going to set act to B plus one, right? So we've got this sin, this sin act, and this act. This is the beginning of every TCP interaction. It's, known, it's so important that it has its own name. It's the TCP handshake. Sin, sin act, act. So now we've got these sequence numbers synchronized between the two endpoints. And as we progress to the stateful interaction, we can just start incrementing these sequence numbers depending on how much data we've sent. So let's look at that. So the next thing we're gonna do now that we've kind of agreed on our sequence numbers with this TCP handshake, is we're gonna send the data. We're ready to send the data. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, again, just as always, we're going to acknowledge we're going to acknowledge host B again. We're going to acknowledge that their sequence number right now is B plus one. So we're acknowledging that. And then we're also going to say, okay, well, we're at A plus one with our sequence number. This is currently the bit of data that we're sending. We're also going to set the push flag in this case. It's not critical to set the push flag, but by sending the push flag, we're saying that, okay, host B, when you receive this data, let the application know that this data is available and we want you to start working with it. Uh, work with it now rather than potentially waiting for me to send you more data. As soon as you receive this and you have all the previous data, we're ready for you to work with it and for the application to process it. Okay, so we send hello world. Now, host B needs to acknowledge that this happened, right? We're going to continuously keep acknowledging the other side uh, so that host A can feel confident that the data has been sent. We're going to acknowledge host A. Uh, we're not just going to leave host A hanging and like wonder, hey, did it actually arrive? I have no idea. Uh, we acknowledge host A. We tell them, yes, we know what you sent. It arrived. So we send an acknowledgement. 
And this time, we're not sending a plus 1. Instead, we're sending a plus 14. So we're sending a plus 14 because we just received 13 bytes of data. That hello, comma, space, world, exclamation point is 13 bytes long. So we're going to add 13 to basically say, OK, if you're going to send me more data, you're going to be at a plus 14 now in this interaction. Uh, I've seen 13 bytes. You could also imagine sending, for example, a plus 10. If somehow this got split apart on the network for some reason, uh, that we missed the last few bytes of it, I might acknowledge and say, hey, I only received up to a plus 10. And it would be up to host a to interpret that and say, OK, OK, you need these last uh, three or four bytes of data back. For some reason, you didn't get it, so that's where you're at. Let me, let me go ahead and send that to you. Um, but in this case, we acknowledge we got the whole message. We're at a plus 14. We acknowledge that we have received it. Host A does not have to sit there wondering, did host B receive my message or not? Host B says, yes, I received your message. I acknowledge that I received your message. This is how we can have this out of order, uh, stateful conversation, the stateful interaction. It's because each side is constantly acknowledging the other side and agreeing where they're at. So we have acknowledged host A. So host A is now going to declare, OK, well, this is all I wanted to send to you. Um, we're done talking. We could keep talking if we wanted to keep uh, sending data and acknowledging each other back and forth for however long it takes to have our interaction. But I'm just sending you hello world. So I'm going to say, OK, Finn, um, I am done. Again, we're going to set our sequence number to A plus 14 because that's where we're at in the interaction. Um, we're going to acknowledge host B because we always acknowledge host B. We tell host B, yep, I agree, you are at B plus 1. And this allows host B, remember, we're acknowledging host B always. We're always acknowledging host A, we're always acknowledging host B. Uh, we acknowledge them because maybe when I'm finishing, host B had decided to send something. So when host B sees this, they're like, hey, I just tried to send you data also. Like, what do you mean you're only acknowledging B plus 1? I just sent you 10 bytes or something. Obviously, that didn't happen in this case, but you could imagine that being the case. So host B is able to say, OK, they're done talking to me. They think I'm here. Cool. Um, in this case, right, host B is not sending anything, but you could imagine the hypothetical situation where host B needs to be confident whether or not its stuff has been seen by host A. Um, in this case, though, right, we're just going to finish up. We're going to say, OK, well, I don't have anything to send you, so you don't have to worry about that. I'm also done talking to you. Um, so in this case, we set our sequence number to B plus 1 because that's where we're at in the interaction. Um, in this case, we're going to acknowledge host A's finish, right, because... Uh, we want host A to know that we know they're finishing, right? So we're just going to add one more to the sequence number again. You can kind of imagine uh, in the same way that we added one to acknowledge that we've synchronized, we're adding one to acknowledge that we're finishing up this interaction. So now we're at A plus 15. Um, we've both sent finishes. Now there's one last little thing that needs to happen. Again, we just are constantly acknowledging each other. We want host B to feel confident knowing that we're done we understand that they are also done talking. So now we are going to acknowledge host B and say, OK, we know you're done talking as well. We've both finished. We've both acknowledged that we finished. We're good to go. Uh, we're going to add one to B as well to kind of progress that forward. And this is what a simple hello world being sent looks like in TCP. The critical thing to see is the sequence number kind of walking forward uh, depending on um, synchronizing or finishing up or sending data. We're kind of incrementing these sequence numbers and we're always acknowledging the other side so that the other side can feel confident that they've been heard, right? Because in some sense, it's, it's a little scary, right? Host A is just sending data out into the ether and hoping it arrives at host B. How does it know it arrives at host B, that it's something that has happened successfully? Well, we know because host B acknowledges us. It's very nice of them. They tell us, yes, I heard what you were saying. And this is the uh, what it looks like to do a TCP transmission.